Guten Tag, good day. Mein Name ist Martin Niemola. My name is Martin Niemola. And I was a Lutheranischer Minister, a Lutheran minister. I am known for having been an ardent opponent of perhaps the most despicable human being in history, Adolf Hitler. Though I must confess that my legacy is somewhat mixed, as we shall see. I was born in Lippstadt, Germany, and became in my younger years a submarine commander during the First World War. I won the Iron Cross First Class, the highest decoration for bravery. After the war, I turned to different pursuits. I decided to take up the study of theology, a very different path from my wartime exploits. I was ordained in 1931, taking up a pastorate at St. Anne's Church in Dahlem, a rather affluent suburb of Berlin. Ich war ein Berliner. Ich war ein Berliner. And yet I was an ardent German nationalist. And it is with considerable shame that I must confess to being an early supporter of this man, Hitler. I welcomed his rise to power in Germany as I penned my autobiography in 1933. It had a catchy title, From U Boat to Pulpit. It was the Nazis and their praise that helped catapult this book to fame in Germany, becoming a bestseller. I, as so many in Germany in those days, referred to those years of the Weimar Republic as years of darkness. It was a time of national humiliation, and it was my hope that Hitler would bring about a great revival of the German nation. We longed for certainty in an uncertain age. Dreams die hard. Yet by the fall of 1934, my faith in Hitler completely collapsed. I saw the dark side of the Third Reich. It was at that time that I helped organize other members of the clergy, what we called the Confessing Church, a group devoted to swimming against the tide. We were alarmed by what we saw as the Nazification of the German churches, as anti-Christian ideas were increasingly tolerated by both clergy and laity. We were especially alarmed by the racial doctrines of the Nazis, Nazi racial ideology. Der Völkerstreit oder Hass untereinander, er wird gepflegt von ganz bestimmten Interessenten. Es ist eine kleine, wurzellose, internationale Clique, die die Völker gegeneinander hetzt, die nicht will, dass sie zur Ruhe kommen. Es sind das die Menschen, die überall und nirgends zu Hause sind, die nirgends einen Boden haben, auf den sie gewachsen sind, sondern die heute in Berlin leben, morgen genauso gut in Brüssel sein können, übermorgen in Paris und dann wieder in Prag oder in Wien oder in London und die sich überall zu Hause fühlen. Es sind die Einzigen, die wirklich als internationale Elemente anzusprechen sind, weil sie überall ihre Geschäfte betätigen können. Aber das Volk kann ihnen ja nicht nachfolgen. Das Volk ist ja gekettet an seinen Boden, ist ja gekettet an seine Heimat, ist ja gebunden an die Lebensmöglichkeiten seines Staates, der Nation. coherent in its way? Actually, in the aftermath of this dark age, some historians look back and question whether Hitler even had an ideology. After all, 
He was first and foremost a politician. And the great question for any historical age is, what politician actually has an ideology? If we wanted to find some coherent ideology in Hitler's mind, what would we look at as proof? Of course, we have Hitler's writings, the most famous of which was his own autobiography, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Doesn't Hitler plainly state his ideology in this book? We have a problem, however. Mein Kampf, it seems, was written after Adolf Hitler became a politician. And what politician tells the truth? Even in the book he writes. If we can't trust what he wrote, what about Hitler's speeches? Such an orator he was, capable of captivating an audience like no one else. He could have been quite a preacher. Don't Hitler's speeches express his true ideology? Unfortunately, his speeches were also delivered after he became a politician. If we can't trust Hitler's writings and can't trust his speeches, what about his actions? Don't actions speak louder than words? Except Hitler was not just a politician. He was an opportunist. So even in his actions, he tried to please everyone. To the capitalists, he promised a capitalist paradise. To the socialists, he promised a socialist paradise. And to everyone, he promised a great resurgence of Germany as a world power. In the final analysis, Hitler's actions prove nothing. We must find something else, perhaps some document that he wrote before he ever became a politician. Here we have the young Hitler standing in a crowd celebrating Germany's entry into World War I. Hitler, of course, served in the war as a corporal. That was certainly a point in Hitler's life before he became a politician. Do we perhaps have a document dating from that period? Well, we do happen to have such a document. A letter written by Hitler during the time when he was employed by the German army to gather intelligence on the inroads of socialism into the ranks of the military. Of course, Hitler equated Jews with socialists, and he wrote this notorious letter on the Jewish question, dated September 16th, 1919. He wrote, anti-Semitism as a political movement should not and cannot be determined by emotional factors. Now, this statement comes as a shock to most people. Or wasn't Adolf Hitler extremely emotional in his anti-Semitism? When we even mention the name Hitler, we think of him ranting and raving, shouting and screaming. And yet, he writes that anti-Semitism cannot be determined by emotional factors. He goes on, but rather by the realization of the facts. And these facts are, first, Jewry is clearly a racial and not a religious group. Importantly, there was a great shift that took place in the 19th century 
from religious anti-Semitism, calling the Jews Christ killers, and seeking either to convert them or murder them, to racial anti-Semitism. Jews came to be defined as a racial, not a religious group, and Jewishness was defined as something in the blood. In the past, if you were lucky, you could escape persecution by converting to Christianity. No more. No certificate of baptism could change the Jewishness in the blood. This shift laid the groundwork for what would become exterminatory anti-Semitism. Hitler writes, All that is for men a source of higher life, be it religion, socialism, or democracy, is for the Jew merely a means to an end, namely the satisfaction of his lust for power and money. How many times down through history has that charge been aired? Money-grubbing Jew. The next sentence is perhaps his most important. His actions will result in a racial tuberculosis, rasen tuberculose, of peoples. Jews are considered to be an infection, a disease. And how does a healthy body combat disease? Now, I'm not a physician. But I understand that there are certain autoimmune reactions. It's the lymph nodes that secrete white blood cells, isn't this correct? Which silently course through the bloodstream and identify the invading agent and kill it. Now, does this reaction happen consciously? Am I aware that when I am attacked by a virus, my body fights it in this way? Am I emotional about it? Are the white blood cells emotional? Do they announce to the invading bacteria, I hate you, I hate you? Of course not. This is simply the response of a healthy body to disease. And this is the essence of racial anti-Semitism. In Hitler's mind, Jews were a disease of the body politic. And the healthy body fights this disease without emotion. People are flabbergasted at this. What do you mean? The, the Nazis didn't go around spewing hate? Technically, I must confess, they did not. Noted Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel was asked, did you feel their hatred? He thought for a moment, and replied, to be honest, no. We could not even say that they hated us. We weren't worthy of their hatred. They didn't even hate us. The healthy body simply kills, and it does so without emotion. You study the films, the archives, and there are masses of them, the photographs. And this is very hard. And it's better to have someone with whom you want to go through all this mental or moral, or whatever you call it, psychological exercise. Ronnie Howard is a perfect man for it. First of all, he had, but there were moments, you know, where either he or I had tears in, in our eyes when we are really shaken. Hitler writes, Hence it follows. Anti-Semitism based on purely emotional grounds will find its ultimate expression in the form of pogroms, which are capricious and thus not truly effective. What is a pogrom? There had been many pogroms across Eastern Europe and Russia during the Tsarist era. Basically, 
there were organized riots, aided and abetted by the authorities themselves. Emotional? Yes. Violent? Yes. But then it was over. The Nazi attitude toward pogroms was, surprisingly enough, negative. Why, you would imagine that the Nazis would applaud pogroms. But such things were, in their eyes, un-German. After all, these were technically illegal, even though the authorities themselves approved them. Hitler wanted everything to happen by law. And that's why Hitler called them capricious and not truly effective. Hitler writes, rational anti-Semitism, however, must pursue a systematic legal campaign against the Jews by the revocation of the special privileges they enjoy in contrast to the other foreigners living among us. The last word people associate with Nazis is legal. But for Hitler and his minions, this was very important. They passed law after devastating law. That was the German way. And in the end, they made murder legal. Jews, after all, were considered foreigners. Never mind that they had been living among us for centuries, that they felt more at home in Germany, Deutschland, than any other country on earth. We must revoke any privileges they have in law. Hitler concludes, but the final objective must be the complete removal of the Jews. Die Entfernung der Juden überhaupt. Historians scrutinize every word in the German, trying to find out exactly what Hitler meant. Complete removal. Was Hitler's anti-Semitism murderous, even at that early date? Characteristically, he writes a euphemism. He's deliberately vague, as if to say, I have a nightmare. Jews are present. I have a dream. Jews disappear. He doesn't say how they are to disappear. Simply gone. But thanks to this important letter from 1919, we know that what Hitler wrote years later in Mein Kampf, after he became a politician, is, in fact, accurate. This was his racial ideology. Here are Hitler's words in Mein Kampf. I began to see Jews distinguished in my eyes from the rest of humanity. Was there any form of filth or profligacy, particularly in cultural life, without at least one Jew involved in it? If you cut even cautiously into such an abscess you found, like a maggot in a rotting body, often dazzled by the sudden light, a kike. What Hitler wanted was an amoral anti-Semitism, emotionless, in his mind, rational, without morality, amoral, Basically, he wanted a few thousand hitmen. Now, when Al Capone hired a hitman, was he filled with hatred at his subject? Did he even know his victim? Usually not. He was simply doing a job. I have nothing against you personally, I'm just shooting you. And so it was with the Nazis. A few thousand hitmen, the elite, those who truly understood Nazi racial ideology. 
the SS. Nazism can be understood as a kind of religion. As a theologian, I can address this. But it was, if anything, an anti-religion religion. You see, when we study the great religions, at least of the rest, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we discover that they have certain things in common. A beginning point describing the genesis of everything. Then a progression, a pathway that people are to follow, usually with many ups and downs. Invariably, they are directional. They point us towards some goal, towards an end, a better day. In Judaism, there is the concept of the Messiah and a messianic age. In Christianity, we have the idea of the second coming. And in Islam, there is a final judgment of humanity. Marxism, a Jewish thing in the eyes of the Nazis, involved class struggle, culminating in a classless society, a utopia. Such ideas were anathema to Hitler and the Nazis. They constructed their own religion. Hitlerism was a religion. Make no mistake about it. They had their own high priest, Hitler himself. The SS was a kind priesthood. They employed the language of sacrifice. They had their own holy book, Mein Kampf, their own rituals, their own initiation ceremonies, all the trappings of religion, and especially blind faith. But for the Nazis, the idea of an end, a messianic age was boring, stagnation. What do you have in the end? The lion laying down with the lamb. The lion should eat the lamb. There must be an endless process, a continuing purification of the race, a kind of social Darwinism that will never end. Eventually, said the Nazis, we will conquer the entire world. But even then, it will not end. Those who were allies, we will someday fight. The Italians, the Arabs, the Japanese, an endless purification. Rather than a directional arrow, history is an endless narrowing spiral, leaving in the end only the purest of the purest of the purest of the purest of the pure. And even when every last Jew has been eliminated, it cannot be over there will still be the Jewish spirit that can infect even non-Jews. And that is why one day I, Martin Niemöller, would be diagnosed by the Nazis with the Jewish spirit. The tale of my suffering will await another day.